Thanks, Dave. You're too gracious. Um, <laughs> so the title is Kierkegaard and Young Adult Anxiety. Because of the short um, time, we're not going to be able to talk about Kierkegaard quite as much as I would like to. But if anybody wants to talk Kierkegaard after, um, I'm always up for talking Kierkegaard. But anyway, um, when we talk about anxiety, the most appropriate Bible verse says that all is vanity, a chasing after the wind. People aren't investing all their emotional resources in the economy or in video games or in celebrity gossip because they're just greedy or eager for distraction or gossipy. They're doing it because religion, in the West, Christianity, has too often failed to give a plausible account of the world kind of emotional plausibility that Simeon talked about earlier, if you heard him. Writing in 1939 on the eve of the Second World War, the Anglican thinker Gerald Hurd wrote, as life has no meaning, we shall increase amusements until everyone is so distracted they won't be able to think even of their own deaths. This is, of course, pathetic nonsense, and were it not such wishful thinking, no rational being could maintain it for a moment. Here, of course, is religion's opportunity, yet we see Western religion as helpless to take it. Youth today, when its hunger for meaning grows unbearable, will turn not to the churches, but to those who preach crusading nationalism. And of course, um, they did. But this sort of modern hunger for meaning that Hurd talks about can also be phrased as anxiety. In a world where we feel that we can't be sure of anything, God, country, or whatever else, we fear meaninglessness above all else. But anxiety is different than just fear. You can be afraid of an impending bear attack, for example, but anxiety makes a lot more sense in the context of fear of personal failure in something. You feel anxious before a job interview. And fear is always related to an external threat, but anxiety is different. Anxiety is reflective. It's always related to the self. Fear is about danger, but anxiety is a special kind of fear. It's a fear of, it's a fear of our own failure, of not measuring up, of sort of coming, on the, coming out on the wrong end of the performance-ism spectrum. So anxiety is always about the self. And of course, right now, there is an epidemic among people in their 20s of anxiety. It's the subject of a lot of great TV shows, a lot of great media articles, and you can do a quick internet search for all the stats on anxiety, um, therapy, prescription medications, panic attacks, it's all there. And if you heard Tullian um, speak last night, he was quoted this um, psychiatrist, Robert Leahy, who said that the average high school student today has the same level of anxiety as the average psychiatric patient in the early 1950s, which is staggering. And so there's no need to really cite any of these statistics, but what I'm concerned with is the relationship of anxiety to Christianity and to the way that church is dealing with it, particularly in its ministry to people in their 20s. So anxiety, as Gerald Hurd suggested, is the church's opportunity, but it's also an opportunity the church is powerless to take. Fear of meaninglessness, fear of guilt, fear of failure, if these factors are what traditionally drive people into the church, drove people to Jesus in the New Testament account, then 20s anxiety from a Christian point of view should lead to the natural question of why church attendance among this demographic especially only continues to decline. Why is Western religion, as Hurd said, powerless to take this opportunity? Well, first, what makes people in my generation so anxious? For starters, there's the question of career. You can be or do anything. You have so much potential, the world's your oyster, and the like. Are you more cut out for finance or education? Is it worth it to go to grad school? What's the point of compromise between doing something you're passionate about and paying the bills, providing for a family? When internship season came around at my college a few years ago, economics and commerce school students were the most worried of anyone about finding business jobs. And yet they were also the best prepared to find them. And it seems like it's the preparation itself that causes anxiety. You have more potential, and more potential means more options. 
And more options means a greater burden to choose the highest paying, the most prestigious, most personally fulfilling one. Whom will you marry and how will you find that person? How will you know that it's right? The guys I know with the widest dating options tend to be the most paralyzed about making the decision. And we can drill down even more. Where will you end up living? Is playing video games really a good way to spend your free time, or is there something more edifying you could be doing? Why hasn't this person returned your text? Dead phone, complete rejection, or some other reason that you'll find out in three hours and hate yourself for being so worried about it? <laughs> Even does this lunch have too many calories? The collective weight of these minutia can be staggering. So we can begin to define anxiety by saying that it always concerns possibility, because wherever there are options, there's the threat that you could choose the wrong one. Anxiety always concerns personal, individual responsibility for something, what in the Christian lingo would be called law. And in that regard, we could even call anxiety premeditated guilt, the fear of failure or wrongdoing. And in the examples I've given, anxiety is related to the future. Will this career decision be the best one? How will this interview go, et cetera? But in addition to the possibility of the future, there's also sort of a sense of possibilities about the past, things that you regret from the past that for some reason make you anxious. So think for a moment about a poor decision you've made in the last few months, or a particularly damaging thing you did years and years ago, something you wish you could have done differently. The feeling is a lot like anxiety, and it seems like it is. In my life, at least, anxiety about the future is never quite so bad as anxiety about something that I could have done differently in the past. And it's that language of could have done that makes us so anxious about the past. So if anxiety is a fear of failure, then it shouldn't make sense to feel anxious about the past. For better or for worse, the die is cast, but we still do feel this way. If anxiety is related to possibility, the thought that we could have done something different is what produces it. And we always think we could have done something different because on the surface, this makes us feel better. It keeps us from having to co fully come to terms with the fact that we have <coughs> messed up in some way. To switch gears a little bit, one example of a mistake um, from the Christian world, or that sort of mistake of possibility, is the way we think about Adam's sin, the fall. People often like to speculate about what life or what history would have been like had Adam not disobeyed God's commandment. What would things have looked like? In the concept of anxiety, a book about anxiety and sin written by Soren Kierkegaard, Danish philosopher, he kind of comes down on that speculation about Adam, saying that it's sort of a collective theological temptation to forget that the fall actually did happen and that we are actually guilty. The fantasy about human innocence certainly might help people distract ourselves from the reality of guilt. And it's the same way with anxiety about the past. A daydream about what things would have been like if I personally had done something differently is escapist. It allows me to forget that I did fail in something. It keeps me from fully apprehending the fact that I am guilty of that. And so anxiety may be fear of guilt or anticipation of guilt, but guilt itself never produces anxiety. Because in true guilt, someone has come to grips with the fact that their failure, sin, or mistake actually did happen and they are responsible for it, and things could not have gone otherwise. No possibility of things going differently. As Kierkegaard says in the same book, as soon as guilt is posited, that is actually felt or understood, anxiety is gone and repentance is there. Mary Carr, in her memoir Lit, talks about a time in her life when she felt small emotions instead of the big emotions. Specifically, she felt anxiety rather than sorrow. And that's a powerful line because Kierkegaard, in a sense, is right. 
Knowing fully that you're guilty of something produces sorrow. Your attempt to shield yourself from sorrow by thinking about how things might have gone differently is what actually produces anxiety. So guilt, in a sense, cancels anxiety about the past. In this sense, sort of anxiety and godly sorrow, godly sorrow what, being what the Christians call repentance, those things are mutually exclusive. To illustrate, think briefly of a job interview. You're, you're really, really anxious about it, and um, then it actually does go horribly wrong. <laughs> People have had this experience. But if you're really anxious about it, you're thinking about what could I have done differently? How could I have prepared better? How could I have been more myself, more spontaneous in this interview? But if you sort of accept the fact that it just went badly, there's a sort of sorrow about it. There's a guilt. I messed up. I didn't do as well as I thought I was going to in that. But there's also a peace that comes with that, a deliverance from anxiety. Now, this is something that people don't always realize, but a lot of times anxious people actually want to know that they failed in something, um, that they're guilty, because it takes out the second guessing. You see this a lot in um, the Christian world with the issue of sexuality. While Christians are often sort of preaching and condemning and trying to get people to agree with um, the church's sexual mores, they often don't realize that pretty much everyone is already anxious about sex. People, people in their 20s don't need that to be sort of produced in them. Um, <laughs> For college students, at least, nothing produces anxiety quite like a bad or awkward um, sort of hookup being, I guess, the contemporary word for it. And there's all these questions about, did I break some code of virtue? You know, was I disrespectful to her? What's our status now? The list goes on. So the possibility of guilt, the guessing, is crushing when it manifests itself as anxiety. But the certainty that someone actually is guilty about something produces only a brief sorrow. It's over and done. There's, there's no choice but to face it, to deal with it. Um, and in some sense, I think that's why the Bible talks about repentance um, preceding peace or Christian freedom, repentance being sorrow. And, you know, in, in the 20s especially, it's, it's keeping on with the sex example, it's more common than ever to sort of have casual sex or live with someone before marriage or stuff like that, um, and it's something that does make a lot of people incredibly anxious. But the main reason sex is a great example isn't that, you know, the 20s are, you know, libertines in this particular period of time or anything else like that. The fact that church has completely, totally dropped the ball on it in some way um, by making the issue too abstract, not by coming down on too liberal a side or too conservative a side, but by not coming down on a pastoral enough side, whatever the position on sexual ethics is. Lots of my non-Christian friends have checked out a church service precisely because of feeling guilty or feeling anxious about feeling guilty about sex. And what do we tell them? Well, here's an example from a sermon to college students from a mainline denomination um, from my time in college. The thinking went like this. You don't own your body. God owns your body. And you're just sort of a steward of it. And when you have sex before marriage or do any kind of misconduct, you're sort of misusing something that isn't yours. But at the moment of marriage, God makes a gift of your body to you so that you can then turn around and give it to the other person. And I think I sort of tuned out at this point, but I'm pretty sure the point was then your husband or wife owns your body, um, et cetera. Um, so this idea, I mean, it's, it's theological nonsense because it's nowhere in the Bible and it's applying a modern idea about property rights where modern ideas about property rights don't really belong and all that. But the theological failures of this idea aren't what's most important. What's most important is that it is utterly and completely unhelpful to anyone feeling any actual anxiety about the issue. It doesn't really relate to real life. Your pastor could easily talk about, you know, sexual ethics in terms of unhealthy overattachment, the dangers of a physical relationship outpacing the emotional connection, and 
you know, y'all have all read this in dozens of books and blogs and all of that. But um, my non-Christian friends who came to it, this is the problem. They might have found truth there if we had talked about it in everyday terms like over attachment. Um, they would have found resonance with the whole sort of ownership idea and other abstractions we come up with. That's only one example. It's just so abstract and so theological and such insider e Christian language. Perhaps hearing a sermon about body ownership confirms the suspicion that those same non-Christians, some of my friends, harbored as they were walking in. It's moralistic. It's irrelevant. It's divorced from everyday life. And so the church, which should give the much-needed gift of being able to actually sorrow over something bad that you've done, instead increases moral um, uncertainty and anxiety because you're sort of hearing all of these judgments, but they don't make sense because they're applied in an abstract way. And that's what makes the second guessing about things in your past that actually increases anxiety. And of course, you can think of plenty of other abstractions from Christian vocabulary. There's dozens. Um, and there's sort of a, a threat of whatever you want to call it, postmodernism, you know, relevance, um, sort of a threat of like relativism or the idea that our concepts are meaningless or the whole Christian thing is just sort of nonsense. And that's what the church feels threatened by. So a lot of times we overcompensate by sort of inventing stuff. Um, to talk about, to try to make sense of it. A different friend, this is the last example I'll give, um, his dog died when he was young and was told by his parents that God was just teaching him how to cope with loss. Now these ideas have no resonance really with the rest of the world and the criticism that Christians don't often deal fully with reality applies to our language most of all. And as with all insider language, we're doing it under threat, defensiveness. But it's sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy when we overcompensate with abstraction. Um, to quote T.S. Eliot, well-known line, um, these fragments, fragments of abstraction in our, in our case, we have shored against our ruin. And yet Christianity, the religion of a crucified and abandoned God, has no real business shoring itself against anything. And sometimes, I mean, maybe the temptation of these abstractions is they shelter us from our own flaws and failures. If God's just sort of using my dog's death to teach me a lesson, then I never really have to deal with the event itself. If I spend all day sort of debating theological ideas about salvation, which we spend a great deal of time doing, and that's very worthwhile, but at the same time, a lot of times talking about it can avoid the emotional relationship we're supposed to have with that doctrine, which the Bible says is fear and trembling in some sense. Now, I'm not saying anything about salvation, so no one get offended. But anyway, just an example of over-theologizing. So anyway, if my Christian ethical system is always abstract, think again of body ownership as an example. I remain in anxiety about sin because my generation, more than any other, is craving answers and yet also has a very well-developed nose for um, what we might call Christian BS. That's what a lot of the rest of the world calls it. Um, but as Kierkegaard says, as soon as guilt is posited, felt, understood, anxiety is gone and repentance is there. So how do we posit guilt in a way that it connects emotionally? In some sense, by meeting people where they are. Kierkegaard had also said that Christianity's task is to explain how my religious existence expresses itself in my outward existence. That is to say, connecting Christianity with real life, not with abstraction, and real life is always personal. The church can make the most sense when it connects not on the basis of insider language or imparting a certain kind of wisdom, but on the basis of empathizing with people where they are and providing a framework to sort of interpret their emotions to them within their own context. 
And that's not to say that we lose hours in the process, but being pastoral means, in some sense, um, meeting people where they are. So in practice, this empathy almost always looks like sharing your own experience with someone who is suffering. The only connection to be had with skeptics or non-Christians is on the basis of shared weakness. Given Christianity's grace message, we as a church should be able to admit and share in weakness, anxieties, and guilt perhaps more than anyone. But there's this strange inability to do so, the powerlessness that Heard talked about. And it, it's, this presents sort of the paradox or the irony that an age group that perhaps should be more church inclined than any other cannot be because the barriers as they stand now are too high. You'll get either a moralistic command couched in this sort of arbitrary abstract language or they get an unhelpfully vague bit of theology. And I don't of course want to be too critical on the church. But if the stats on church attendance and the sort of media reputation and all of that are any evidence, then there really is a problem, and it's a dire one. And it seems like the first solution that Christianity ever proposes to anything is pointing the finger at yourself, the Apostle Paul, foremost among sinners, as he says. So what will it take to fix? My first thought, um, of course, was that we could all just resolve to go out and be more forthcoming about our problems, more empathetic, become more attuned to reality by becoming more willing to face the weakness that is uh, in ourselves and the ruin which is always the place where grace shows itself more clearly. But that's just sort of another law. And that won't work, at least not by our own willpower. Resolutions rarely produce humility. Acts of love are never calculated, but always spontaneous, always spirit-driven. And since anxiety and guilt have always driven people to religion, perhaps we're due for a revival at some point. And there is great hope for the church in this area, but maybe not in the way that we would first think. To go back to Gerald Hurd, um, he thought in 1939 that the threat of meaninglessness, of vanity, is the church's opportunity. And 74 years after Heard wrote, we still haven't really taken that opportunity if, again, the statistics are to be trusted. But still the thoughts of personal inadequacy, the search for meaning, none of these can necessarily be quelled by us having poor language or the inability to admit weakness a lot of the time. The good news is that the church itself is becoming more and more subject to anxiety. Its place in the world is continually called into question by academia or by the media. Perhaps this small issue will wear away at the dross of abstract theology. Kierkegaard, the great theologian of the heart, would have been very happy to know that the abstract idealist very, very Christian philosophy of his day would be defeated by secular alternatives that were at least more concrete and forced people to get in touch more with their emotions, which is the touchstone of the Christian message. He said in, 19, in 1846 that Christianity is spirit. Spirit is inwardness. Inwardness is subjectivity. Subjectivity is essentially passion. And in its maximum, an infinite, personal, passionate interest in one's eternal happiness, a touchstone. In a time of heightened anxiety, people can't help but be inward, cannot help but be passionate, even if it's about the minutia. And for people in the church, the best thing, perhaps, that could happen would be anxiety wearing us down to our own inwardness, our own emotional passion, our own weakness. Because community built on shared weakness and then and only then on shared grace is the heart of the church's ideal. No other major institution, perhaps with the exception of Alcoholics Anonymous, offers to build a bridge to someone else's inwardness, to their anxiety or to their need or to their suffering. And here the message of grace, God's love for sinners through Christ, 
again becomes the most important, not least to us, the church, and our mixed communication of this grace. So while our hope for the church remains murky and doubtful and mixed, we can still take comfort in the objective, unchanging message of the gospel of forgiveness for sinners through Christ, through the cross. The message that speaks to all the anxious inside and outside the church, and the only message that we or anyone else has ever needed. Thanks.